All right, today we're going to start, and we'll finish as well, uh, section 5.4. We're going to take a look at exponential functions. I think that you will like this section. Yes, sir. Papers. Thank you. So I think that you will like this section. Okay, so we are going to do both differentiation and integration, um, and you'll kind of see why putting them in the same section makes a lot of sense here. Um, and what we're going to be taking a look at specifically to start with is our natural exponential functions. And then I think it's our next lesson, 5-5, five, five, where we're going to expand that idea and encompass other exponential functions as well. So definition first of the natural exponential function. The inverse function of y equal natural log of x is called the natural exponential function. So it's the inverse of the natural log function. It's denoted f inverse of x is e to the x or y equals e to the x if and only if x is equal to the natural log of y. Now you've probably encountered this function before. Uh, it usually shows up in an Algebra 2 course. Um, it's an interesting thing, though, because when you learn about it in Algebra 2, you usually learn about the e to the x function in some sort of a context um, where you're finding compound interest. Um, or maybe you're looking at exponential growth of populations, something like that. And usually you encounter the e to the x kind of function first, and then someone defines the natural log function based upon the e to the x function, and we've done it backwards in this course, right? We started with natural log functions, and then now we're talking about the exponential functions. And we even defined our natural log functions as an integral of 1 over x, right? That's how we defined where this came from. Now, it's going to be helpful for us as we're working our way through to have some properties, kind of like when we did logarithmic properties. So much like in our previous sections, we're going to go back and look at some of the algebra things. So as you look through this, you're going to be like, that looks familiar, that looks familiar, and it will be until about halfway through, and then we're going to switch into the calculus component, okay? So first, exponential properties. So these are properties that we teach um, all the way down to college algebra for sure here at OBU. Um, and there are six of them, and I'm going to add a couple more to it um, that you're familiar with as well. Um, so if you'll remember, uh, these are ways that we can combine or separate exponentials. So when we have two bases that match, a to the m and a to the n, we can add the exponents, m plus n. Um, and there's lots of good reasons behind all of these, and I do teach that and show that in my other classes, but that's not really our component or our focus for now, so I'm going to avoid doing that at the moment. Uh, if we have division, a to the m over a to the n, we subtract the exponents, a to the m minus n. If we have a power raised to a power a to the m to the n, we multiply their exponents, a to the m n. When we have two bases, a times b raised to a power m, we can raise each of them individually to the power m. Notice a and b are multiplied in order for this to happen. They're not added and subtracted. Okay, multiplied. 5 is divided. If a and b are divided, we can do the same thing. We can apply the exponent to each of them individually. And 6 talks about what happens when we have a negative exponent. So a negative exponent applies the power to each of them individually, but it also reciprocal, does a reciprocal or flips the fraction. So a over b becomes b over a. So pay attention carefully to that notation. It switches. Now there's a couple more that you've seen. One is a application of one of these. What is a to the negative one? So we'll call this seven. One over a, so it's the reciprocal. So this is just a very specific case of number six. Okay, it's one over a. Um, and the eighth one that we're going to sort of write in here is what happens when we have a zero power. Do you remember what happens when we have a zero power? One. It's equal to one. So those are going to come up um, at different points potentially today and in your homeworks and things like that. So just remember these particular properties. They'll help us to do some simplifications and so forth at different points. Okay? So shake your head if all of that looks familiar. Maybe you wouldn't have been able to write all the right-hand sides of everything before I showed them to you, but they look familiar. They should. These should not be new information. Could everybody get them all jotted down? I think so. All right, so what we're going to do first is we're going to just do the algebra components, the things that you've seen before but not for a while, and we're going to solve for x, and it's going to be um, accurate to three decimals. Now, when it says accurate to three decimals, we're going to solve it exactly first, and then we're going to let the calculator do the approximation. We don't want to round things too soon, so we don't want to round in the middle of what we're working on. 
So taking a look at this, our goal is to solve for e to the x. So the first thing we would do is, of course, to add the 6. So this is 3e to the x equals 14. What would you then? Divide by 3. And now we're at a place where you may or may not remember what we do next. Um, we do natural log. Somebody remembered. That's wonderful. So you can either remember the way that you can actually convert this into a log expression or the easier approach just that works in general and it will sort of lend itself well to what we're doing in 5.5 is that just like you can take, say, like a square root of both sides, right? You can actually take the natural log of both sides. So we're going to take the natural log of both sides. It's a function. It's an operation, right? We can do something with it, so we can do it to both sides. Um, the nice thing on the left-hand side is we now have properties of logs. The exponent x can come down to the front. We'll come back to that in a moment. If you really wanted to separate the natural log of the 14 thirds, you could write natural log of 14 minus natural log of 3. That doesn't really help us any, so I'm not going to do that. Um, but it is another way to write it. And then what's the natural log of e? It's 1. We talked about that one before. Um, this property is that this is equal to the number 1. So we've actually, in fact, solved for x on the left-hand side. The exact expression is the natural log of 14 thirds. Um, or you could write that this is the natural log of 14 minus the natural log of 3. Those are both exact versions um, of the correct answer. But the directions want us to confirm uh, or to give an answer as well with three decimal places. So grab your calculator, put in either one of those, and let's get a decimal approximation for the natural log. Um, it's not a decimal, sorry, it will have a decimal, but of, of the natural log of 14 thirds. So to three decimals, what do you get? 1.540. Okay. And thank you, Connor, for actually noticing that we need to write the zero. If it says three decimal places and the last one ends in zero, you're still going to write zero, right? Y'all are science people. You know how that works, right? Yes. Good, good. So this is our three decimal version of this answer. All good? Okay, that's algebra. We've got one more algebra. Uh, the next one's actually starting out in natural log form. It says the natural log of 4x equals 1. So directions are the same to solve to three decimal places. Um, and in very much the same way, and actually I'll show this one in a couple of ways. Um, in, in much the same way that we did the last one, you could take e and write these as exponents on e. So that's one option, right? Much like you take the natural log of both sides, you can do e to a power of both sides, okay? What that does over here is this e and this natural log are inverse operations, which leaves you with 4x. e to the 1 is just e. And then you can divide by 4. So x is e over 4. There's nothing wrong with doing it that way. It's perfectly fine, and it will work very well. That's not how I think of this, though. So I'd like to show you the other version of how you can do this. And that way, if it does resonate better or makes more sense, you have another option. We talked about the fact that natural log of e is log base e of 4x. Right? Well, it's not log base e, of log base e. And then we have 4x. So another op option of how you can rewrite this um, in exponential form, it looks like this. So you circle the base, and you're going to draw an arrow around. I had a student tell me one time that their teacher called it a scorpion tail. That's not my thing, but I think it's a pretty good visual. Okay, so if we circle the E and we draw the arrow around, we can rewrite this in exponential notation. E is my base, follow the arrow, it crosses to the one on the other side next. So E to the power of one, and it lands at four X. So I learn very visually. That's the way my brain works. I'm trying to remember um, my phone combination on my, we have, a, we have a combination on our Netflix account at home because my kids will get on and they'll watch things they're not supposed to watch or times they're not supposed to watch it. And so we have a passcode. So they have to bring us the, the um, remote and we have to put the passcode in every time. So I know what the remote's code is in terms of numbers, but my fingers know where they are and I can do it without being in the room and seeing the numbers, right? That's how my brain thinks. So I like this approach a little bit better. It doesn't work any differently. Obviously, we get to the same point. E to the 1, right, as what we had over here, is equal to the 4x. Levi? Can you do that without e? Can you 
you just like uh, make it exponentiate on both sides with just numbers and stuff? Is that what it I'm not sure I understand your question exactly. So if it was just 4x and 1, could I do, instead of doing e, could I do 2 and then turn 4x into, like it wouldn't make sense for this problem. Do you mean if it said the natural log of 2 and it didn't have a variable? Write me out an example and we'll take a look. Um, let's yeah, get into, oh, what you got? Base and e, like a number base. Yeah, it. if we don't have a number base, which we'll do in 5.5. So if we have a different base and it's not base e, can you do it? Is that what you're asking? Yes. So if this is log base 5, can you rewrite it that way? Absolutely. Cool. Yeah, you can. And so I'll show that actually when we get to 5.5, a version of that too. Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, all right, so either way, we end up at this point dividing by 4. So x is equal to e over 4. And grab a calculator, get a decimal approximation for that. So a couple places, and I know I mentioned it before, um, there's two places in your calculator that have e's. Um, so one of them has e, and it automatically puts a caret next to it. That's underneath the natural log button. So if you hit second natural log, it's going to put e with a caret after it. That's fine. You can just put a number one, right? It's e to the one, and then you can divide that by four. The other location for e is under the division sign, like the actual division key has just an e. So if you want to use e and you don't want the caret after it, which in this case we don't really need it, so it would work fine to do it too. So you can do second and the division sign. That gives you an e, and you can divide by 4. It, of course, could be the same answer. And either version is going to give you a decimal approximation that's what? 0. 0.680. 0. 0.680. Okay. Is that good? All right, so just like what we did with logs, we're going to do the next thing with graphs. So we're going to take a look at the graph of e to the x. So you've got your calculator out. Go ahead and y equals and graph e to the x. Um, just a standard window will be just fine. So if you want to do zoom 6, you'll see enough of what we're looking at to be able to work with what we're working. If you want to zoom in a little bit or ignore the bottom half of the graph, you could do that as well. It's not negative right? So the, everything on the lower part of the graph underneath the x-axis is not necessary. So if you wanted to make your window go from y equals zero and up, that would be okay too. Get a little bit better picture. But the graph looks something like this. Okay, so it looks something like that. Hope so. And there's a bunch of features of this graph that are mentioned over here. Um, you have a y-intercept at 0, 1. So there's my y-intercept. Uh, there is no x-intercept. It actually has a horizontal asymptote on the x-axis, otherwise known as the line y equals 0. So while it's not drawn in, I'll draw mine dotted just slightly above it so you can kind of see where I'm talking about. That's my horizontal asymptote here. It increases without bound. Right? As x goes to infinity, y goes to infinity. Limits. Its domain is everything. You can go as far left as you want to as far right as you want. So it's negative infinity to infinity. But its range is just the top half of the graph. So it's from 0 to infinity on y. It's continuous. Right? You can draw it without picking up your pencil. It's 1 to 1. Remember, 1 to 1 means it passes the horizontal line test. We talked about that last time specifically because we looked at inverses, right? And it's concave up. So these are a smattering of different kinds of features that come some from algebra, some from calculus, and they are all applicable to this graph. Now, I know many of you are still writing, but once you're done writing, I want you to get out your notes from section 5.1. The front page is fine. So in section 5.1, we drew a graph of the natural log of x. This was my 5.1, okay? And we wrote down a whole bunch of features of that graph. And now we've written about a bunch of features of the graph e to the x. And I'd like for you just to compare the lists. So our two lists have some things that are in common. And then they have some things that seem like that they're switching places. 
For example, the graph that's on the screen right now has a y-intercept at 0, 1 and no x-intercept. But the graph we did back on the first day has an x-intercept at 1, 0, and it has no y-intercept. They seem like they're switching, right? This one has, the one on the screen, has a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0. The natural log graph had a vertical asymptote at x equals 0. Again, it seems like it's switching. Both of them are actually increasing without bound. That was a feature that's in common to both of them. The domain on the graph we're looking at right now is negative infinity to infinity and the range is zero to infinity. But the graph's domain and range that we did before are switched of that. The domain was zero to infinity and the range was negative infinity to infinity. Both are continuous. Both are one to one. And this one's concave up while the other one was concave down. So again, it sort of seems like it's switching. You've still got your graph on your calculator, so I'd like for you to go ahead and put it back in the standard zoom window, so zoom six. But in y equals, I'd like for you to add the graph of the natural log of x into y2. So graph the natural log of x along with the graph we already did. And if I draw it on my screen here, I'm gonna erase the asymptote I drew. It looks something like this. Sure looks something like that-ish. And go ahead and y3 in your calculator and write in y equal x. So my picture's not perfect on the screen, but it should closely resemble what we did last time. These graphs are inverses of each other, right? One of them is a reflection across the line y equal x of the other graph. Okay, so these are inverse graphs of each other. And that should make sense, at least because that's how we defined this to be. This is the inverse function. And graphically, we've sort of checked off it verified that fact. Uh, and that's why you're seeing all of these features either mimicking or reversing one another. In particular, the reversing one another, you can see why that's happening then, right? So like, let's look at domain and range in particular. The domain for the graph on my screen is negative infinity to infinity, but the range is negative infinity to infinity of the other graph, right? X's and Y's are switching. So the domain and range are switching. Okay, same thing for the x-intercepts, y-intercepts, for the asymptotes. Everything's switching in those features because the x and the y graphs, uh, or x's and the y's switch when we do inverses. All right, let's remember then how we do transformations and sort of think about what happens a little bit differently or maybe a little bit differently than you thought about um, in this graph. So there's different kinds of transformations. Um, we do transformations which shift things left and right, up and down, they reflect things. Uh, they stretch them, they shrink them, and they're all affecting um, the graph based upon uh, constant multipliers or constants that are added or subtracted. So if we have a general equation, y equals ae to the bx plus c and then plus d, pay, pay, pay specific attention to the fact that the b plus c is in the exponent, the d is not. So the a at the beginning is a vertical stretch or shrink. If the number is bigger than one, it's a stretch. It makes it bigger vertically. So imagine it takes, so our graph itself has an end that's up here on the left. Your right, sorry, your right up here. And if you're stretching it, you're pulling it up further. So it's going to make it narrower is what it's going to look like for us. It's going to make it stretched up longer. Um, the shrink is a value when you get a fraction, it's between zero and one. So it, make, it looks like it compresses it. Sometimes it's called a compression. So you take the graph and you sort of, I mean, you can't compress from the y-axis or the x-axis, that's holding steady, but you're sort of squishing it down so it's gonna look kind of like fatter, right? If you do that. The b value is a multiplication factor on x that's in the exponent. That's going to be a stretch or a shrink in the y, or in the, um, in the, vertic or the horizontal components. So it's going to either, if you've got um, the b is a fraction, 
it's going to end up being a stretch. So if you think about a fraction and it pulls it, so we're talking about a, a vertical. So if we graph our graph and we pull it like this, like a rubber band, right, it's going to make it look, again, fatter, much like the shrink did on our vertical axis. And if the value is bigger than zero, it's going to uh, make it, it's going to do the opposite. Okay, so they're going to be opposite of what you would wish. So you have a stretch if B is between zero and one, a shrink if it's greater than one. So it's, they switch with one another. The C value being grouped up with the exponent is going to shift it left or right. Okay, so anything that happens inside with X does it in the opposite way we would expect. So a negative actually moves it right and a positive moves it left. Okay, we talked about this with log graphs. And then the D at the end affects Y values. So if the value is positive, it shifts it up. It happens exactly as we would expect. And if it's a negative, it shifts it down. Now, you might notice we didn't talk about what happens on the A and the B if they're negative, did we? We talked about bigger than one and between zero and one, but we didn't say what happens when it's less than one. Because less than one doesn't become a shrink or a stretch, it's actually a reflection. So let's actually examine real quick which one's which so that you can see from a calculator standpoint. If you clear out y2 and y3, we don't need them. Let's just make our um, value in front of e to the x negative. So you're going to put into your calculator just a negative in front of e to the x. So it should say negative e to the x. So that's equivalent to making the a value at the front here negative. So if a is a negative 1 and graph it, standard window like you had before, what happened to the graph? It flipped over the x-axis. It flipped from being concave up and increasing to concave down now and uh, decreasing, right? It flipped over the x-axis. So the negative in front, just like the horizontal or just like the vertical stretches and shrinks that we talked about with A, affects the vertical values or the y values. It's affecting y values. So anything that's on the outside of the exponent affects y values. The d at the end is affecting y values. It's shifting it up and down. The a at the beginning is stretching and shrinking y values. And if it's negative, it's flipping the y values. And you're welcome to go ahead and look at the same thing if you take the negative off of that and you put the negative in the exponent. So now if we do e to the negative x, and you graph it, you'll see that the reflection is now over the y-axis, right? So anything that's grouped with the exponent is going to, to affect the x values. So it switches all my x values around. Everything that was positive x is now negative x on the graph. It just flips it around the y-axis, which affects my x values. We're not going to do a whole lot with graphing, but I want you to recognize those features um, if they come up and they're useful to you in any way. So are you ready to do some calculus stuff? Because this is the part you're going to like. Don't get excited. Nobody's excited at all. Man, what a bummer. All right, we're going to do it anyway. The derivative. This is the best derivative you're going to ever encounter. It's so friendly. Because the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. Think with me for a moment. If the derivative of e to the x is e to the x, what's the antiderivative of e to the x? It's also going to be e to the x. It's going to have a plus c on the end, but it's still going to be itself. It's the only one that does this. No other function that you work with, I guess you could say zero. The derivative of zero is zero, but it's antiderivative isn't. So no other function that you work with does this. The derivative of e to the x is e to the x. That's very friendly. All right. You ready to try some derivatives then? Okay. Okay. Taking a look at this, though, I mean, obviously, we're not just starting with what's the derivative of e to the x. You already know that. We're going to take all the other derivative rules that we know, and we're going to now incorporate them with this new property that we have, right, this new derivative rule that we have. So taking a look at what's on our screen, what is the overarching property or rule that you're going to have to employ on this? There's a couple of them, but there's one that's sort of the big overarching one. Product rule. There's a product rule here, right? We have two pieces that are multiplied. We have an x squared and we have an e to the negative x. What is another property or rule that you're going to need to use? Chain rule. 
So it's going to be a chain rule because the negative x is not just, it's not just e to the x, it's e to the negative x. So we are going to also have a power rule. You're right, we're going to have a power rule with the x squared. Okay? So we have all these rules that are going on, but the overarching rule is the product rule. So the first thing when we do the product rule, you can do this in another order, but you guys know um, that what I do is I just write the first one down. So the derivative of um, x squared e to the x starts out by having just x squared. And then I need the derivative of e to the negative x. So the e to the negative x has got the chain rule that Adrian mentioned, right? So the derivative of e to a power is e to a power, but then I need the derivative of the power. So what's the derivative of negative x? Negative 1. It's not very exciting, but that is its derivative, right? Yes. Then I'm going to have addition. Product rule has addition between the components, and we take the derivative of the first piece. That's one the Tanner said is the power rule. So what's the derivative of x squared? 2x. And then we rewrite the second piece. Now, not this Thursday, but next Thursday, the day after Valentine's Day. Do you know what we're doing in class? Yeah. So we're doing a gateway. We are. We're doing a gateway. Um, the gateway is going to be very similar to the gateway you saw before. You're going to have 20 questions. They're going to be messy, and it's going to be ugly and gross. And um, you're going to have just a few more new rules, right? This is one of them, and the log rule is one of them. And we're going to encounter the other two that we're going to have on Thursday, I think. I don't think there's anything new after Thursday in terms of new rules, okay? So you have a few extra new rules to be incorporated in within those. If we were doing the gateway on this problem, we would stop here, right? And we would all be very grateful that we don't have to simplify anything on a gateway, right? Yeah. Uh, for the purposes of what we're doing now, we are going to simplify this. It's not got a lot going on to simplify. Um, in fact, really, the only thing we can do is to pull this negative to the front. It's negative x squared e to the negative x plus 2x e to the negative x. Um, if we were wanting to do something with this further, we might try and factor some pieces. Like we, we might do that. Uh, but we will do that in different contexts, but we don't need to do it here. Right? This is as simplified as it can get. Adrian. I just, I think I missed it. The uh, chain rule for uh, e to the negative x, y is it just e negative x right there? Times why is it times? Is that, why, why is it done in the left hand? Okay, so I think you're asking me why this piece, mm -hmm. where this piece came from? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. Okay. So in general, the derivative of e to any power is e to that power. Okay. So that's why we're getting the e to the negative x not changed. But then we have to take the derivative of the exponent's power, I mean, well, the derivative of the power or of the exponent, which is the negative one that's coming down. Okay? Okay. All good? Okay. So we're simplified as much as we're going to get. We're done on this problem. The next one is what rule? Quotient, quotient rule. And I'm trying to think. I don't think that we've done a quotient rule in class uh, this semester, actually. So we've got a quotient rule here. The quotient rule, um, if you remember, is if I write it as high over low and I take the derivative, it's, oh, I need more space here. Do you remember what we said it was? Low d high minus high d low over low low and away we go. All right. If you don't like that, you can blame, um, you, you can blame Dr. Drake. Um, I got that from him. Uh, I, I used to do this a different one, but I thought this one was cuter, so I used it now. Um, all right, so we start with the denominator. That's how this starts. So the denominator is the first piece. That's the low part. So e to the 2x. And then, sorry, plus 1. Get the part there, all of it. e to the 2x plus 1. So we start with the denominator. And we do it times the derivative of the numerator. So I need it times the derivative of e to the 2x. That's a chain rule. What's the derivative of e to the 2x? e to the 2x and then times 2. OK? That's half of my numerator. And then I need subtraction, right? Product rule uses addition. Chain, uh, and then the uh, quotient rule uses subtraction. And now we'll reverse it. Now we need high, the numerator. That's just the e to the 2x. And I need the derivative of the denominator. So the derivative of the denominator is very similar to the derivative of the numerator on this one because they're closely related anyway, right? 
What is the derivative of e to the 2x minus 1, or plus what is it? Plus 1. e to the 2x times 2. And the plus 1 is a constant rule, so it goes away. And then I divide by low, low. Right. e to the 2x plus 1 squared. And you all remember that very seldom do we ever distribute the denominator. We usually leave it in that compacted form, and that's the most friendly for anything that we move forward and do next anyway. Sometimes it even cancels because we've left it in that form. We'll get some cancellation going on. This one we won't. Okay, again, gateway, you stop, right? Not a gateway, you don't. We're going to clean up that numerator, and it's going to compact and condense down pretty nicely for us, actually. So we're going to multiply some things out. So we have the 2 here. And if you wish, you can remember that this makes this just 2e to the 2x, right? That's what's going on inside there. Same thing over here. So I'm going to distribute this to each of the pieces over here. Um, the 2 is going to stay. What is e to the x, I'm sorry, e to the 2x times e to the 2x? 4x. e to the 4x. You got it. So that's one of those properties that we talked about earlier on, and this is how we're using it, right? e to the 2x times e to the 2x, and you add the 2x's together to get 4x. And then I need to distribute the other piece, so I have positive, whoops, 2, e to the 2, so positive 2, e to the 2x, this piece, there we go. Is that all right? The same thing is going to happen on the second half of that numerator. I have 2e to the 2x times e to the 2x. It's subtraction now. So I have, again, 2e to the 4x. Denominator stays the same. And what do we notice? Yeah, there's some cancellation. This piece and this piece are exactly the same opposite signs. So those are going to cancel out. And our overall pieces that we're left with are e to the 2x over e to the 2x, sorry, 2e to the 2x is on top, over e to the 2x plus 1 squared. Okay, is that all right? Variation says what we're going to do next. Second derivative. Right? So to find a second derivative, we have to first find the first derivative, right? So we're going to do the same thing as our first step, find the first derivative. What's the overarching rule that you see here present? Product rule. And we also have a chain rule going on too, but we have a product rule too. So product rule says I rewrite the first piece the same as it is already. And then I need the derivative of e to the negative 3x. So what's the derivative of e to the negative 3x? Negative. Excellent. So it's e to the negative 3x times the negative 3. If you notice it quickly enough, you're welcome to do like Pierce just suggested and go ahead and move it in front. I'll do that this time. Is everybody good with all those pieces? Okay, excellent. Uh, the other one, then it's addition. Uh, I need the derivative of 3 plus 2x, which is 2. So I have a 2, and then we'll rewrite the second piece, e to the negative 3x. Okay. Um, gateway, you leave it. Um, this is a second derivative question, so both for the fact that it's a second derivative question and for the fact that it's not a gateway, we're going to clean it up a little bit. You do not want to take another derivative from this form. That would not be very friendly anyway. So um, let's go ahead and take this and clean it up. I'll just leave it as equals. So we'll distribute this piece through over here. So that gives me negative 9e to the negative 3x and negative 6 x e to the negative 3x, and then I have plus 2 e to the negative 3x. So again, before I go any steps further, are there anything that can be combined? This one and this one, right? Okay, why can't I combine it with the one in the middle? It's got an x in it. Okay, good. So pay attention to all the pieces because they get a little messy. Um, negative 9 positive 2 gives me negative 7. So negative 7e to the negative 3x minus 6xe to the negative 3x. Okay, 
we're going to take the derivative now of that. So second derivative. All right, so what's the derivative of negative 7e to the negative 3x? 21e to the negative 3x? Excellent. So where did the 21 come from? Negative 7 times negative 3. Yeah, the constant in front, negative 7, times the derivative of the inside, negative 3. You can do that in a single step if you need to show it in two steps because it makes more sense than do that. But that's correct. So the second one, though, I actually have a what rule? Yeah, this piece has a product rule in it, right? So I have, and there's a negative in front, so we need to be careful. So I'm going to put the negative in front. You can even put the negative 6 in front if you wish. I'm just going to put the negative. Um, so the product rule says I'm going to include the first piece, and then I need the derivative of the second piece. So what's the derivative of e to the negative 3x? Three. Negative 3. Yeah, e to the negative 3x, right? And then we'll take the derivative of the 6x. So again, I've moved my negative to the beginning to ignore it for the moment. So this would be plus 6 and then e to the negative 3x. If you didn't want to move it to the front and you wanted to put it right there, you could have done it too. Um, I just wanted to isolate that piece. So we're going to clean up inside of here and move the negative through. I'll do that probably in the same step, I think. So we have 21 e to the negative 3x over here on the outside. And then I'm going to move my negative through. So this negative makes negative 6x times the negative 3. So that will give me a positive 18x e to the negative 3x. And then I have a negative 6 e to the negative 3x. Okay, we've done all the calculus. We've already done a step now of algebra cleanup a little bit. Is there anything that can be combined? You have the 21 and the negative 6, which gives me what? 15e to the negative 3x, and then plus 18x e to the negative 3x. Okay. And again, if we were wanting to do something further with this, like find out where this is equal to 0, we might want to factor it. There might be some versions of things that we might want to do differently, but unless we're indicated to do so, this is a perfectly good place to stop for our second derivative. Okay, you ready to do antiderivatives? Okay, they're not going to be any more complicated because, again, they're just the best derivative and antiderivative rule you're going to have. If you have f of x is equal to e to the x, and you take its antiderivative, it is again e to the x, but again, as always, we're going to put a plus c. And I'd like to just remind you of why that happens on the plus c. Remember, what derivatives are is they tell us the slope of something. The slope of something is not dependent upon where it is in the plane. So if you have the slope of something and you shift it up or down, it doesn't change the shape of the curve. That's what the plus c on the end is doing. It's telling you that it could be shifted up and down and it wouldn't change anything and you'd still have this same function if you were to take its derivative. So that's where that plus c comes from. Okay, so we're going to take and do a couple of examples of this, three of them, I think. So here's our first one. Now, it's not just e to the x. That wouldn't be very exciting. It's e to something else. But that something else, if we were taking a derivative, we would say, hey, look, there's a chain rule, right? So when we see chain rule, ish looking things showing up inside of an antiderivative, what do we do? Use substitution. We don't have a lot of choices right now. There's really only two things we can do if we can't directly take an antiderivative. Algebra or trig simplification and u substitution. And u substitution is the one that's going to be most helpful here. So my u will be everything that's in the exponent. And the reason, I mean, truly speaking, from what we can do, let me just put this down for a second, is that when I replace this, it's going to be replaced by e to the u, and I know how to take the derivative of e to the u. It's great. It's itself. So what is the derivative, du, of 1 minus 3x? Negative 3 and then dx, right? Now, if you look back at the problem, I don't have a negative 3. We've done these recently. We would divide then by the negative 3. Or equivalently, what I do and write on the outside again instead is that I've got a multiplication factor of negative 1 third. And so the dx at the end gets replaced by the negative 1 third that I just wrote at the beginning and the du at the end. So all of this piece right here is showing up here and here as a replacement for dx. 
all that okay? I know we've done that recently, but it's all good, okay? So the negative one-third stays. What's the antiderivative of e to the u? e to the u and plus c. We don't get a stop here, though. Why? Yeah, problem started out with x's, needs to have x's when we end, so I need to replace the u with what u is equal to, and it's equal to 1 minus 3x, and then plus c. If you wanted to confirm that this really is the antiderivative, what could you do? Take the derivative. If you take the derivative of this, it should go backwards and you should end with what you began with, right? And we would. Okay, is that all right? Okay, the next one's more complicated. Okay, so it looks bad, but it's actually not that much different than when we've seen before. You just don't see it because there's ease involved. Okay, so back, in, I don't know if it was last section or a couple sections ago. I think it was a couple sections ago because last time was inverse stuff. We had addition and subtraction of rationals, right? There was like addition and subtraction of polynomial on top, addition and subtraction of polynomial on bottom. We talked about the fact that the problem here is the addition and subtraction in the denominator. Y'all remember that? So if there were just addition and subtraction in the numerator and it just had one piece, like one term in the denominator, you might be able to separate this out as like individual fractions that are usable. Okay? So for example, without ease involved, let me show you what I'm saying. If you had like 4x squared plus 3x and it was all over x to the third, right, a single piece in the denominator, you potentially could separate this out into fractions and use some algebra simplification and go from there. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Okay, but the problem is that when we have addition and subtraction in the denominator, that kind of algebra simplification just falls short. We can't do that. So this type of a, of a reducing or separating out of fractions doesn't work when there's addition and subtraction in the denominator. So there's only two things we have. We have algebra or trig simplification, neither of which works here, and the other option is u substitution, right? So it must mean that we're going to use Use substitution. You just don't have any tools. I mean, like, there's all you've got is a hammer. So you're going to use that hammer to bang the screw into the wall right now, too, if that's what it takes. Because you just don't have any choices, right? Use substitution everywhere you go. I mean, that's it. Okay, so what's the use substitution, though? Well, the use substitution is the part that's causing the problem, which is the denominator. So our u is going to be what's on bottom. So u is e to the x minus e to the negative x. It's the denominator. So when we come back over here in a moment, we're going to have to deal with the numerator itself, but there's just going to be a u in the denominator. All right, so what is the derivative of e to the x minus e to the negative x? e to the x plus e to the negative x. Okay, so e to the x is itself, and then the e to the negative x would be multiplied by a negative 1. So since that negative 1 will have the opposite effect of the sign in the middle, we're going to have plus e to the negative x here. And then it's dx on the end, right? Okay, and what do you notice? That's actually what's in my numerator, isn't it? Okay, it's exactly what's in my numerator. So this piece replaces even more nicely, if you will, than the previous one. There's no numbers to divide by or anything like that, like I had my negative one-third um, that showed up in the front of the other one. And this is an antiderivative we've learned this semester. What's the antiderivative of one over u? Good job. Natural log of the absolute value of u plus c. The absolute values. Remember those guys, right? They show up here. Problem's not done. All right? We replace u with what u is equal to, which is e to the x minus e to the negative x. And then we have plus c. Uh, you might be tempted to say, well, is there any way to clean up this mess that's right here, right? The natural log absolute value, e to all this piece right here. There's addition and subtraction inside, so the answer is no. Okay, if there weren't addition and subtraction, we might be able to toy with this a little bit and, and clean it up a little bit. Um, you might also remember that there are times when I told you that you can remove the absolute values and times when you can't. You okay there? Yeah. Sorry. Okay, just checking. <laughs> okay, absolute values. The absolute values ensure that what comes into the natural log on the inside is positive. 
Now, in this case, e to the x is already positive, right? Think about the graph. We just did it today. Everything's above the x-axis. So if this just said natural log of 3e to the x, then we wouldn't need absolute values, right? But this e to the negative x component means that we have to be a little bit more careful. So we'll leave our absolute values on there and not worry too much more about it. If this had said addition inside, it actually could be removed and it would, we wouldn't need them. But leaving them there is never a problem. Okay, so you can always just leave them and not worry about what I'm discussing, but it is something that if you see it later, I want you to be like, why'd they take those off? Oh, that's right, I see positives only on the inside. That's gonna be the reason why. Okay, our last example. How is this one different than the other two? It's a definite integral. It's got numbers, right? Limits of integration at the top and the bottom. That adds an extra step on at the end is what it really does, right? But in the meantime, what do we not put on the problem? Do you remember what we leave off when we plus do definite C. integrals? Plus Cs. We don't need any plus Cs when we're doing definite integrals. Okay? So let's take a look at this one. What does it look like is happening inside of this integral? Mess. What's that? A mess. A mess. Okay. What kind of a rule does it look like? If we, if we had this and you were doing uh, a derivative, what rule would you be trying to try? You'd be using a product rule, right? Um, there's no product rule for antiderivatives. Uh, and in fact, when we get to chapter eight, you're gonna really wish there were. Because since there's not the ability to have a sim single product rule, anytime there's a product, there's lots of things that could happen. But right now, you only have one tool. What's your tool? Use substitution. Use substitution. <laughs> So, you see, it's a bunch of mess, like Adrienne said, but you still think, well, but the only thing I can do is use substitution, so that's going to be what I'm going to do anyway, okay? So, use substitution, but what's the u going to be? The exponent on the e. This exponent on e is different than all the other exponents we have seen today, isn't it? So far, we've only seen linear exponents. We saw things like negative 3x or 1 minus 2x or 3x or whatever it was. They were only linear. This one's actually quadratic. So this is negative x squared over 2 is our exponent. What is the derivative of negative x squared over 2? Negative x du or dx? Yeah, it's negative x dx. Okay, so the 2 comes down. The 2 is going to cancel with the denominator, 2. So you're going to get the 2s to go away, and you're going to be left with the negative at the beginning and the x. Now, our problem doesn't quite have that in it, but it's close. What is it missing? It's missing a negative. So we're going to move the negative over here. This is negative 1 or just negative du is going to be replacing the x dx. So in the front, we have a negative, And inside, we have e to the u du. Don't forget the, u, the e part. Right? That didn't go away. What did I do? I left off the limits of integration. I mentioned this last time. Do you remember why I did that? It's not x anymore. Those limits of integration apply to x, and you have two choices. One choice is that you can take each of those numbers, 0 and square root 2, and you can plug them in here, and you can figure out what the corresponding value should be for you. I don't do it that way. I think it's more work, and there's more chance for making errors. So what I do is I leave them off, which is a, it's. it's I'm not just making that up. You can do that. <laughs> so it's not just Dr. Han's way of shortcutting the system. It is option number two, which is to leave off the limits of integration for now. And then when we put the x's back in a little bit later, we'll put the limits of integration back on. So for now, what is the antiderivative of e to the u? Yeah, it's e to the u, and we still had our negative in front. So the negative in front stayed. The antiderivative of e to the u is e to the u. That's not e. How about that one? e to the u. Um, I don't need a plus C, right? I'm going to be putting numbers here in a minute. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to replace U with what U is equal to, which is X squared over 2. And then I can do my limits of integration, which are square root of 2 and 0. Yes? Negative. Uh, negative is missing. Yes, thank you. Okay, did I get all the other pieces? Okay, cool. All right, everything look okay? All is good? So we're going to put in a square root of 2. So I'm going to just show, um, I've got a negative out here in front. I have e 
to the negative square root of two squared over two. I'm gonna show it put in one at a time. If you don't wanna show it that way, that's okay. And then have minus a negative e to the negative zero squared over, over two is what I really have. Okay, so let's simplify this. All right, so if I have square root of two squared, I get two, two divided by two is one, and I've got the negative in front, right? So this entire exponent on the first piece is negative one. We'll talk about that in a second. So you have e, negative e to the negative one. Um, negative, negative here, so this is positive. Um, zero squared is? Zero. Divided by two. Zero. And then times the negative at the front? Zero. So this is just e to the zero. Okay? You can't leave either of those pieces that way. Number one, you can't leave negative exponents, and number two, you can't leave zero exponents. All right, that's what both of these are. So what do we do about the e to the negative one business? Property number seven that I wrote down. What happens when you have a negative exponent? Oh, it's one over. It's one over. Okay, so the negative in front stays, and then this is one over e. What about e to the zero? That one's one. Okay, so this is a perfectly acceptable way to write this answer. You might see people switching it, right? One minus one over e. You might also see them combining these together and getting a common denominator, okay? So if you're looking at some sort of a um, like photo math kind of thing and it's trying to tell you what it is and it tells you that, I don't want you to freak out and think you did something wrong. I don't have a problem with you checking your work, but I don't want the check step to make it feel like you did something wrong. There's multiple ways to express this and they would all be equally correct. This version's perfectly fine, so I'm not gonna change it, but that's what we would have. Okay, any questions on that? All right.